well, you can imagine that we are not on the American Chemistry Council's Christmas card list anymore. They're not too happy with us. Um, but um, we started writing these stories showing the bias that the federal agency had to studies conducted uh, with money paid for by the bisphenol A makers themselves. And um, it doesn't take any scientific background to know that, that just doesn't smell right. Um, and so while uh, the, these stories uh, were coming out, you know, in a conventional way. They were also making a big splash uh, in the blogosphere and on the internet. And as a reporter who's been in the business for 30 years, it's just kind of fascinating for me to to think of how these stories uh, had a much farther reach. Uh, you know, today's technology being and what it was. So our audience was really well beyond the Milwaukee borders. And um, anyway, so that was kind of fun to know that our stories were having a wide reach. And um, the lawyers and his people came calling, and um, back in uh, February, uh, two, a year and a half ago, and almost two years ago, they came out and watched us in action, which we thought, good luck finding anything exciting about that. But anyway, out they came, and um, in Milwaukee in February for a week, and um, we think that the camera guy might still be stuck to a fire hydrant on <laughs> Kinnick Avenue. Um, but anyway, the show aired May of 2008, and so more letters and emails poured in, and people seemed very impressed that a mid-sized Midwestern newspaper would devote that kind of time and money to this topic. Um, and then uh, we went Ivy League. Columbia University did a case study on our reporting methods, and they seemed especially impressed that we would dispatch Suzanne to scour these 258 scientific studies. It's not your usual, um, you know, newspaper story where you go out and quote the man in the street. Um, and then the awards started rolling in, um, which we were thrilled about. We got the um, John B. Oaks. Uh, award. Uh, oh, my husband did this PowerPoint. He's so silly. He thought that would be really cool to show it rolling up on the screen. And then, ta-da, Sigmund Altakai, and then Scripps Howard, and then the Polk Award, and then we were finalists for the Pulitzer Prize in investigative reporting, and that was all really exciting. Um, and at the same time, things were really heating up politically. Oh, we have to do this again. Here we go. Uh, so, Long Island was the first. <laughs> Followed by Chicago, and then Minnesota and Connecticut, and um, these um, these uh, states and cities were uh, enacting bans against BPA uh, for baby bottles. Now the blogs were crackling about worries about uh, BPA, and baby bottle makers said that they would begin phasing out using the chemical in making their products. And last April, Sunoco, one of the few BPA makers in the country informed their customers that they would not sell this chemical anymore uh, to make baby bottles. Um, so we knew that our stories, we weren't the only ones reporting this, but we were certainly, you know, among the most aggressive. Well, that brings us <laughs> to last May, right here in Washington, D.C., at the Swanky Cosmos Club. Uh, they held a meeting. Uh, the plastics lobby, the makers of BPA, very unhappy about our coverage. Um, and they had a secret meeting, or what they thought was a secret meeting, to talk about strategy and um, how uh, publicity, uh, the stories that we were writing were, were hurting the sales. We're talking about a $6 billion industry, and their sales were being uh, affected by stories like ours. Um, and so when they got together at the Cosmos Club, they talked about what it would take to uh, put a good face on this chemical, and they decided that the ultimate would be to find a pregnant woman to talk about the benefits of BPA, and this person would become known as the Holy Grail. Well, 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 <laughs> as I said, we found out about it and um, got copies of the summary of the meeting and had a front page story the next day, and now they were really angry. <laughs> Um, Congress, too, uh, having read our story, and then the day after our story, the Washington Post, you might have heard of that newspaper, they had the story as well. And um, so the Congressional Committee on Energy and Commerce uh, sent a letter to industry leaders saying, what's this about this meeting? We want details. And a congressional investigation had been launched. So what started out as a drizzle was shaping up to be a storm. And Suzanne and I held our breath and waited for the next bolt of lightning. Ta-da! 
And it came <laughs> two weeks later when Trevor Butterworth wrote a blistering 27,000-word screed on the media's treatment of the safety of BPA. He singled us out for leading the charge on calling BPA's safety into question. 27,000 words. This was no casual musing or light academic exercise. It was clearly meant to discredit us. Uh, and that got us thinking, who's Trevor Butterworth? And what is, <laughs> who is he? What is the Statistical Assessment Center? What's the Center for Media and Public Affairs? Uh, that's an organization that shares the same office, the same tax forms, and many of the same, um, uh, the, same, the same office and many of the same officers. And they were claiming, falsely, that we relied only on a handful of scientists uh, when a thorough reading of our two years' worth of stories quotes more than three dozen. Um, and why did they go after the judges of those awards that we won, uh, claiming that they, they too were part of a campaign to scare American consumers? Okay, um, so we started digging, and our digging took, uh, again, and our digging took us to the bowels of the Tobacco Institute, and this is where we learned that the Center for Media and Public Affairs uh, had been, oh yeah, there we go, thanks, uh, had been um, paid by the tobacco industry to, to, to look at their media strategy on the dangers of cigarette smoking. One of the documents showed a media strategy that included tracking individual reporters and how they covered the controversy. It felt oddly familiar in a very icky way. Uh, anyway, we continued scrutinized uh, financial uh, disclosures and found that the person who wrote the benchmark study hadn't disclosed his ties to the California EPA. And this is the diagram that we came up with, which we tried to make look like a baby bottle, but it really looks like an eye chart for an alien with two pupils. <laughs> but it shows the tobacco industry and the uh, chemical industry sharing, as we just said, as I just said previously, lobbyists and a media strategy. And, and uh, anyway, this controversy is not going to die lightly, and it continues to broil on. And just two weeks ago, uh, 36 scientists sent a letter to the FDA urging them to um, get on with it and take a look at the, and enough already with the studies. There's been plenty of studies out there. And I put this last one in there because it just looked funny. And um, in Milwaukee, we like beer. And so if they ever do get rid of baby bottles, we hope they don't drink out of bottles like this. But anyway, we thank you. Thank you.